Hold it, let's do this. Okay, take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Rabbi Bolovsky, for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to be here speaking to the Golders Green Synagogue. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about Jews and the 1888 Jack the Ripper murders. And a few years ago, I was in the East End of London for research on literary depictions of Jewish migrant spaces, which is part of what I'm, I'm looking at in, in a book that I'm writing. And the East End has been synonymous with British Jewish migration and culture of the late 19th century and early 20th century. So it's not so surprising that I would be in the East End. Um, you know, some Jews stayed in the neighborhood looking for refuge from persecution. Others looked for opportunities or for a better economic future. But that day, I was not exactly in the East End to learn about the history of Jewish migrants or its literature. I was not visiting art exhibits or former Jewish sites. I wasn't even going to the markets or the cafes. I was there to go on what one Telegraph columnist called the nonstop money spinning merry-go-round of Jack the Ripper tours. With multiple groups of wide-eyed tourists traipsing through Whitechapel, many of those tours had close to a hundred visitors. I imagined on that day that Jack the Ripper was evidently continuing to terrorize local residents and no less deviously than when he stalked the area in, 19, in 1888. But even before the Whitechapel murders, the East End was a place of morbid fascination in Gothic literature. It was linked with the unknown, the unhomely, where past and present and east and west, us and them were brought into uncomfortable proximity. And especially in, Victoria, in Victorian newsprint, the East End became the focal point for a lot of the debates and social studies that revolved around ideas of Englishness and belonging. The East End was a borderland where many of the social fears were projected onto dangerous, uncomfortable figures in the press, and especially foreign uncomfortable figures, and more precisely, foreign alien Jews from Eastern Europe, who stood for all that was un-British in an ever-changing London. What I'm going to discuss today is how issues of poverty and criminality and Jewish migration were brought to the fore in media events surrounding the Whitechapel murders that took place from 1888 to 1889. The profusion of sensational literature that grew out of these events, as I'll show you in a moment, point to how morbidly fascinating the notion was of an unknown border crossing monster lurking the streets among immigrants and misfits and the dispossessed. But as well, it promoted Jewish intellectuals and writers to respond to that media image of the alien Jew and respond with their own ideas about Jewish experience and culture and also ideas of what immigration and home and belonging meant to them. And I'm certainly not the only one who would argue that images of Jews as foreign or uncanny had very real political and social consequences on the Jewish experience in Britain. You only have to think about the effect of the Aliens Act of 1905 and what effect it had on Jewish refugees or even other attitudes towards refugees decades later around the world wars. So what does that have to do with Jack the Ripper? Well, there are two issues that I was particularly interested in when I embarked on my research into the Ripper murders. Number one, people are still quite absorbed with the mystery of who Jack the Ripper was. There are hundreds, if not thousands of Ripperologists and their followers still transfixed with the question of his identity. 
And the theory that comes up most often is that he was a Jewish immigrant. Now, whether he was or was not is probably not so significant, but the fascination with the Ripper murders and the language used to describe the murderer and Whitechapel in the Victorian press tell us a lot about the spaces that immigrant Jews occupied within the British imagination more generally in this period. And there's another issue that I find equally significant, which is how did Jews at the time respond to their unfair construction as criminal or creepy or uncanny in that time of media hype around the murders? And that might be somewhat important in understanding how Jewish communities can respond to unfair portrayal in the media in other contexts as well. So in attempting to address these issues, I'm going to give you a few brief examples of how the Victorian press linked the Ripper murders and criminality in the East End with the foreignness of Jews. And then I'll show you just a, a few of the reactions and the strategies that Jewish leaders, such as the chief rabbi and other intellectuals use to challenge those depictions. And what we can see is that it is in within this push-pull of responses to the Jack the Ripper murders, there's a lot to be learned, not only about the impact of sensationalist news media on public opinion, but also how Jews as a minority culture sought to deal with a situation that distorted their cultural contributions and experiences. So I'll just give you a, a little bit of the historical and social context to put you in that time. And one thing to understand is that the issue of a so-called alien invasion, in quotes, in other words, an, a Jewish invasion, was debated heatedly in Victorian print media. An estimated 120,000 to 150,000 Jews from Russia, Poland, as well as from Austria and Romania, settled in Britain between 1882 and 1901. Demographic studies indicated that in London, the numbers of Jewish immigrants from 1850 to 1882 rose from about 12 to 13,000 to 50,000. This figure doubled by 1889, the time of the Jack the Ripper murders. By 1887, about 45 to 50 percent of the entire population of Whitechapel and St. George's was Jewish. And historians of Anglo Jewry, such as Chaim Vermont, Bill Fishman, David Feldman, Todd Endelman, and others, have looked at the social and political impact of this immigration, which was due in part to the pogroms in Russia following the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881 and the temporary regulations of May 1882, but it was also a result of the economic downturn and many demographic changes that were, that were happening in Russia at the time. The impact of this migration on the East End is well documented. It was an area already characterized by dire poverty, and it was now plagued by overcrowding, lack of sanitary services, and poor working conditions, in particular sweated labor. The state of the East End and Jewish migration had an impact on British literature too. A great number of books that focused on the conditions of outcast London were published in the 1880s. The East End in these works is depicted as a place of sexual danger populated by a degenerate and immoral class of people and a so-called problematic integration of Jewish immigrants in the East End, and the kind of racial language used to describe them became even more prominent in post-1880 urban narratives. There were popular books such as W.H. Wilkins' The Alien Invasion in 1892, or Margaret Harkness's In Darkest London, which was published in 1891, and they all fueled ideas that Jewish immigrants would impact English society negatively. Works such as Charles Booth's 17-volume Social Study 
The Life and Labor of the People in London, which came out in 1902, presented perhaps a more subtle and empiric observation of Jewish immigrant life. But for the most part, immigrant life was depicted as foreign, rather gloomy and miserable, and most often glimpsed through the lens of Darwinian degeneration theory. The impact of these books, however, does not even come close to in its effect compared to the nefarious depictions of immigrant London in newsprint media focusing on the Ripper murders. And obviously, this was due to its wide readership. By 1888, London had 13 morning and nine evening national dailies, including the new Hatpenny Upstart, The Star, which had a circulation of over 200,000 during the Ripper murders, which rose to 300,000 after the last murder, which made it the newspaper with the largest evening circulation in Britain. The Whitechapel murders, as the ultimate unsolved crime, drew readers like no previous event in the history of print media. And the profit gained from such sales undoubtedly bolstered the media's tendency to raise the fear and indignation of the public. After all, fear was good for business. And this was not only true for Victorian newspapers, but also for pop popular Gothic narratives more broadly. So just think of um, Stevenson's Mr. Hyde and Grand Stoker's Dracula a decade later. Well, the sheer number of newspapers in circulation in the 1880s was a phenomenon that required innovation in reporting in order to sell copy. This new journalism of the Victorian period relied on a type of sensational blood and thunder detective type storytelling to serve an ever growing market of readers. And it goes without saying that the Ripper murders did not only have an impact on the blood and thunder depiction of Jewish immigrants in London. After all, there were significantly five or perhaps six women who were killed in the most brutal manner during the period between August 31st and November 9th, 1888. But it was the fascination with the unknown murderer rather than the known victims that dominated the press. And it drew the media to pepper their feature stories with wild theories and speculations as to his identity. And there was another significant thing about the coverage. Because there were so many unknown elements, reporters had to fill the gaps and fill up space in the newspaper copies. And they did this by depicting the locations of the murders, areas that were densely populated by Jewish immigrants, synagogues, cemeteries, and Jewish social clubs. These strategies of gap filling within the media exposure give us some of the most critical clues as to the broader social and political situation for Jewish immigrants in that period. And this is most significant in the STARS campaign. And I'll just show you a few examples here so that you can see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> now, the Ripper media coverage capitalized on the public's craving to hear more about the gruesome murders. It frequently used terms like monster, fiend, half man, half beast, and specter to describe the killer. But it also hinted at Jewish origins within those terms. So what you see here is that as early as August 31st, when Marianne or Polly Nichols, who was a streetwalker, was killed, a poster was put up looking for a man nicknamed Leather Apron, 
whom witnesses claimed was making threats towards local prostitutes. The primary police suspect was a Polish Jewish boot, making, boot maker named John Pizer, who did indeed sometimes wear a leather apron, although mostly at home or when he was working. By September 5th, a special issue began with a headline, a noiseless midnight terror, which you see here, the strange character who prowls about Whitechapel after midnight, universal fear among women, slippered feet, and sharp leather knife. And the series of reports that followed this one continued to describe the suspect as an unpleasant character who is more ghoulish and devilish brute than can be found in all of the pages of shocking fiction. And the murderer's unsavory character and physicality are connected with his Jewish origins. And this becomes more pronounced as the reports proceed. And you see here, you know, from all accounts, he is four foot five inches, a dark close fitting cap, which is obviously a kippah. Um, I believe he's a Jew or Jewish parentage, his face being of a marked Hebrew type. And what you see is from the first sentence to the last, Jewishness kind of frames the description, beginning with the suspect's skull cap, uh, closing with the belief of his Jewish parentage. And it's through this lens that all the other details about leather apron are filtered, drawing a very clear picture of a dark, foreign, and you know, exceedingly repellent type, which you see here in these illustrations. And it goes on when the hunt for the leather apron intensifies. So by September 6, the Star reported um, that um, they were searching through all the quarters, and I'll quote this, where the crazy Jew was likely to be. And this was not only the Star. The East London Observer also drew attention to the suspect's Jewish character, noting the way that story circulated that a man with a skull cap and a horrible face called the victim out of a public house at five o'clock. Um, even when John Pizer was found and also found to be innocent with a very strong alibi, the East London Observer report drew, still drew to attention to his dark hued face, which was not altogether pleasant to look upon and the thin lips and the cruel sardonic kind of look and that his head was large and was fixed to the body by a thick heavy looking neck and these were all typical characteristics and markers of difference that pointed to Jewish degeneracy and more widely they were linked with theories of criminal anatomy. The reports that followed perpetuated the image of the murderer as a marked Hebrew type with suspicions revolving around him being a shoichet or an insane religious fanatic of some sort. The metaphor of darkness connected to the area of the East End, to Whitechapel in general, was also spreading from the, the murderer's skin to the location in which he prowled. So one reporter who visited a few of the lodging houses, for example, describes Thrall Street as, I'm quoting here, one of the darkest and most terrible looking spots in Whitechapel. And of course, darkness has always been connected with dirt and disease and drunkenness and violence and pollution and overcrowding. Uh, and also, actually, there were there was Bill Fishman points this out um, a lack of street lights um, in Whitechapel at that time, which actually improved after the whole media attention to the darkness of these streets. But it still gives an impression and a feeling of a, a kind of unhomely and criminal nature of the East End more generally, and this was repeatedly underscored in the reports. So it shouldn't be surprising perhaps that the depiction of the East End Jews 
and their environs provided a lot of fodder at that time for anti-alien agitators. And this was most notorious following the Chapman murder on September 8th. And in an article entitled, A Riot Against the Jews, a correspondent of the East London Observer noted that the excitement in Hanbury Street and the surrounding neighborhood still continues. Extra police have been employed to keep a course for the traffic of the evening. Uh, but in this, they are very much hampered by noisy crowds of men and boys crying down with the Jews. It was a Jew who did it. No Englishman did it. And you can imagine the distress this posed for Jewish immigrants in the East End. Even the Jewish Chronicle, which often tended to downplay incidents of anti-Semitism, noted Without doubt, the foreign Jews of the East End have been in some peril during the past week, owing to the sensationalism of which the district has been the center. Recognizing the kind of violence that could ensue, on October 8th, when police found a chalk inscription near the body of the last murder victim, Eddowes, on Golston Street, which was near a Jewish residence, it read, the Jews shall not be blamed for nothing. And at that point, the commissioner of police, Sir Giles Warren, ordered it to be raced immediately. Now, by this time, some of you might be wondering, was Jack the, the Ripper Jewish? Well, perhaps he was and perhaps he wasn't. And even if the question were important, there's little evidence left from the case to point either way. Much of the evidence was either lifted or destroyed during the Blitz of World War II. The speculation does show, however, that a disproportionate amount of opinions are that he was a Polish Jewish immigrant, whether that's true or not. At the time, from the 150 suspects that police took in for questioning, about a third were Jewish. This in itself was significant enough to draw attention from Jewish public intellectuals at the time who felt a need to respond, seeking to defend the honor of the Jewish community. So what was the Jewish response to the murders? In many ways, Jewish figures responded in a variety of manners, but ultimately they wanted to give a more accurate picture of Jews who called the East End home. There were official letters from the chief rabbi and board of deputies who sought to shed rationalist light on the Jewish experience and Jewish culture and Jewish beliefs. There were also more vivid and varied depictions of Jewish viewpoints among poets and fiction writers, giving voice to both the sense of dislocation and pathos of the immigrant experience, but also to the cultural vibrancy that was very fundamental to Jewish life in London. As the official newspaper representing Anglo Jewry, the Jewish Chronicle, did not report very much on the Jack the Ripper murders. Itself a telling signal. This was not, as they considered, a Jewish issue. It was a criminal one. David Cesarani's wonderful analysis of the Jewish Chronicle from 1841 to 1991 likewise observes that the Chronicle downplayed the murders until the general press began to insinuate that the killer might be a Jewish butcher. At this point, the editor went to the city division surgeon to show him the knives used by Shochtim. This was not to say that letters to the editor did not express the concern of many Jews about their representation in the media, but the angst-ridden tone of the letters was not mirrored in any of the official responses. What's very telling, however, are the letters written by Rabbi Herman Adler 
to counter some of these depictions. And here I'll share my screen with you once again um, to show you this very interesting letter. Um, now, this letter is in connection uh, with a hint of blood libel that arose in correlation with the Whitechapel murders. And it was made by a Vienna correspondent of the Times on October 2nd, 1888. And the article that this refers to reported that a Jew named Ritter had been arrested near Krakow and was charged with the ritual murder of a Christian woman, believing that, according to the article in the Times, having had sexual intercourse with his victim, he was obliged by law to kill her. And by correlating these two events, the insinuation was that the case in Vienna would shed light on the Whitechapel murders. What especially drew Adler to respond was the final line of that Times report, which said that while Ritter, the Krakow Jew was acquitted, and I'm quoting here, evidence touching the superstitions prevailing among some of the ignorant and degraded of his co-religionists remains on record and was never wholly disproved. And then a letter to the editor from a doctor in, in London in the same issue speculated that Jack the Ripper was most likely an earnest religionist with a delusion that he had a mission from above to extirpate vice by assassination. So immediately following this, and you see this a little bit in, in the letter that I have up here. Um, it, in the next day's issue in the Times, Adler immediately wrote a letter to confront the accusations. And what's really interesting is the rhetoric, rhetoric that he uses, which on the one hand, clearly indicates his indignation. But also I've, what I've done here is to look a little bit at his strategy, which is very interesting. So I've highlighted some of these words that are significant and I've um, in red and underlined some other words, which I think are significant so you can compare them. Because it's very interesting to look at his strategy here. Adler's tone is forceful and he's very incensed, rightfully so, but he's also telling in the way he appeals to, first of all, eminent Christian divines and scholars as proof that the blood libels are false. And he also counters evidence touching the superstitions with evidence of his own. So he, he appeals in many ways to linking Jewish morals with English morals, both of which shirk from abhorrent fables and falsehoods. And similarly, Rabbi Gaster, the chief rabbi of the Spanish and Portuguese in this same issue uh, wrote that superstitions do not prevail among Jews even in the most degraded position, but these are superstitions entertained against Jews from which the Jews turn with horror and disgust. So what's fascinating about this, I think, is that in both letters by um, Rabbi Gaster and Rabbi Adler, they don't not only appeal to reason, but they use terms like specter and horror and disgust and moribund, all common terminology in the blood and thunder media speculations, but he overturns them and uses it to characterize the creators of those false superstitions instead of the Jews. Now for the rest of the year, the murders obsessed the press, including the Yiddish press. At the same time, however, Jewish writers were also challenging popular images of the Jewish immigrant, often in very radical texts, political texts, and they were using innovative, aesthetically challenging methods. And you can just think of Israel Zangwill's depiction of the East End in, in Children of the Ghetto, you know, to see how it, it so clearly resists 
the idea that there is one unifying Jewish type of immigrant. So I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of an example here because what I thought was a really interesting response was Yiddish public intellectual Morris Benchevsky's response, who, and he gave what I think is a very poignant counter narrative to the media representation of, of Jewish immigrants in the East End, not only in the Victorian English press, but also in the Anglo Jewish one. So Winchevsky, if you don't know who he, he is, notably founded the London-based radical newspaper, Der Polisher Yiddel, the little Polish Jew. And then he split from it to establish a socialist paper, Der Arbeiter Freund, the worker's friend. And that was in 1885. And the aim of the newspaper was to arouse the social consciousness of immigrants and to defend I'm quoting here, the immigrants honor and language, which was Yiddish, against the slanders of acculturated Jews. So this was not only just about um, the Victorian depiction of Jews, but also the depiction of Jewish immigrants by acculturated Jews. And to this then, in the same year, he established the Burner Street Club for workers, which became the headquarters of the press, as well as a place for political and intellectual activity. What's interesting here is that the third victim of the Whitechapel murders, Elizabeth Stride, was found outside the Burner Street Club in October 1888. But in that report, none of the multiculturalism or social progressivism or intellectual life of Jewish, of this Jewish space would be evident in any of the reports. It was left to writers like Vincevsky to illuminate both the political vivacity of the East End, and also the humanity and pathos involved for poor Jews migrating to the new country. Now, Winchevsky did write about Jack the Ripper in the Forberts in New York years after the murders uh, in, a, in a short article called Der Meshugene Philosoph in England, the crazy philosopher in England, and that was in 1905. But it's this poem that I'm showing you here, The Sad Tale of the Greener in London, which was written actually before the murders, but I think it best sums up a strategy that creates a very different viewpoint to consider, the image of the nameless, homeless Jew of the immigrant experience. Have you seen a young man, hungry and dirty, passing here and seeking all through the long night, a small place, a door, a hole in the pavement where he can lie down and rest. It's so cold and wet. The greener uh, of this poet is in direct contrast to the image of that unhomely displaced Jew that was perpetuated in Victorian print culture. The speaker stresses the protagonist's youth the modesty of his requirements, which are small, simply a place to rest his head for the night. Have you seen this man, the speaker asks. And one wonders if the speaker is looking for this nameless man, seeking him out in the cold and wet night, or if the speaker is criticizing the reader for his or her lack of insight. If you have not seen this man, perhaps you are not looking properly. He seems to admonish us. So just to conclude, decades after the Whitechapel murders and into the years leading up to World War II, the imagined spaces of the Jewish East End continued to function as a symbol for the ways in which Britain negotiated the incorporation of its foreigners, especially foreign Jews, into its borders popular theories about Jack the Ripper and his Jewish connections continue to fascinate the media as a quick Google search will show. But most of all, I find Chaim Vermont's poignant observation uh, the most telling, where he, uh, he summarizes um, the Jewish connection with, Jew with the Ripper media, Ripper media sensation thus. The East End has been the home 
of many great men, saints, sages, scholars, explorers, trade union leaders, statesmen, but the one name that still lingers in the public mind and is known to every schoolboy is Jack the Ripper. Thank you very much. I, I don't hear you, Rabbi Belovsky. You'll have to unmute. That's very good. Okay. Sorry, let's try that again. Mia, thank you very much for that fascinating presentation. Um, are there any questions? You may have to unmute yourself, but uh, do speak if you'd like to ask a question. I think I might take that as a no. I take that as a no, or <laughs> put it in the chat. If you if you don't want to ask a question, you can put it in the chat. Well, Anne Orkins, this is such an interesting presentation. Thank you. So it's greatly appreciated, but it's not a question. <laughs> it could be an observation, not a, not not only a question. Thanks so much. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. Um, some of you may get an opportunity to meet me in person Zoom. we'll be visiting our community sometime in July. Um, and thank you very much. I still, it's just starting to get dark here, but I suspect in Glasgow, it's not even close to getting dark yet. No, sun's shining. <laughs> <laughs> very rarely does it shine here in, in Glasgow, but it is still shines shining. Shines when I visit Glasgow. <laughs> well, um, well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, well, thank you so much and, for inviting uh, me. It was a real pleasure to be here. Is that someone asking something? Okay. Oh, background noise. Um, good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Okay. I guess you can.